Hello everyone, welcome to my 1cc commentary video for Crimson Clover World Explosion. Actually, World Ignition, not World Explosion, because as much as I appreciate the new Nintendo Switch port of the game with all its new features and new graphics and all that good stuff, I decided to go back to the older PC port of the game, World Ignition, for basically one reason. A uh, thousand points, whoever types it in before I can get it out of my mouth. Input lag. Of course, input lag. While the Nintendo Switch version, World Explosion, isn't too bad in terms of Nintendo Switch shmup ports and all that sort of thing, I do think that playing it on PC is still much more responsive. And when it comes to really challenging modes like original arcade mode, every little bit of advantage really helps. Every little frame of lag you can shave off really makes a difference, especially in the later stages. And with the ship type that I use, Type Z, which is a very fast moving ship. Obviously the most powerful ship in the game and very, very good. But the thing about it that can be a little bit challenging is that its movement speed is so high. This is a bullet hell. And so being able to maneuver around with full control really makes a difference where when you're playing it on the Nintendo Switch, it does feel at times like you're Mario in the original Mario Bros where you're just kind of slipping and sliding around the screen more than you want. But anyway, I kind of have a fun little theory that I want to discuss before getting into the game itself as far as why I think the new port is kind of hanging out on the Nintendo Switch for a while before it makes its way to the PC. Of course, you could say maybe that it takes some extra effort and all that sort of thing dev time wise. But I think another theory that I have has to do with the price point of the game and how Dejika have kind of put themselves in a weird situation with the PC version. So I believe the Nintendo Switch price of the game is 20 bucks at least. Last time I checked, maybe, I don't know. I think that's what it is, right? And so the thing about playing it on the Nintendo Switch is it's basically a full-priced shmup release. It's not a full-priced game, but most shmups come out around 20 bucks, 15 bucks, somewhere in there. Some of the more premium ones, like the M2 ports, will dare to drop at 40. I'll have to make a video on shmup pricing here anyway, pretty soon. But I think what has happened is that Crimson Clover World Ignition has got itself in kind of a weird situation on the PC because for the past few years now, it's been selling at insanely low prices. I mean, I remember, for example, when I first started the podcast, I thought it'd be fun to do a summer giveaway of Crimson Clover copies. And this was when Crimson Clover was on sale for $2.50 a copy. And I think the problem was is that I didn't have enough viewers. I remember basically purchasing 10 copies or preparing to purchase 10 copies but I didn't have enough viewers who did not have the game to give them all away I think I only gave away about three copies everyone else either already owned the game or didn't have a PC <laughs> so um, like a gaming PC or whatever so yeah that's how difficult it is to move this game even when you're giving it away for free just because the price has gotten so low so I could see this could be kind of a weird pricing situation with world explosion when it comes to Steam because it'll jump back up to 20 bucks or if they'll have to discount it. I don't know what they're going to do, but I think that's kind of the reason why it's hanging out on the Switch a little bit is to get a little bit more money off of those releases before they bring it to Steam. That's my little conspiracy theory. If not, whatever. It's kind of fun to talk about. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about Crimson Clover, World Ignition, whatever itself. So we're in the early stages. One thing you already notice about this run, if you are familiar with the game, is that I'm going for a low rank, low scoring clear. The reason for that is the more you score in the game, like many bullet hells, especially like DOJ and uh, cave shmups, the more you score and the more you use your hypers and all that sort of good stuff, the more you increase your rank, which means the harder the game gets. So the funny thing is, is there's actually an extra scoring, well not scoring, it's actually star extent that I miss out on, but I decide to do that intentionally with my routing the reason for that being is that I want to try and nerf the final attack as much as possible. The final boss is really the final TLB is basically the big choke point between me getting the clear or not getting the clear. And playing it on a little bit of a lower rank tends to make a big difference at least when you're doing that final attack and stuff. So that's one reason why I'm playing on lower uh, rank or playing kind of not to get a lot of stars is because... I want to try and nerf that final attack because you can't roll back the rank, I don't think. Maybe you can, but you can't roll back your star count, and I think that influences your rank to some degree. So you'll notice in the stage two here, 
I'm doing all these sort of bombs and doing all this sort of pretty careless stuff. That's because I really don't care. I don't care if I don't get any star items or whatever, if I need to use the recovery items. Um, sometimes I was even considering just skipping the upgrade items altogether. You know, if I maybe get it like energy refills when I don't need them or whatever. Just because I'm, again, I'm trying to keep the star count intentionally low. Uh, I think uh, people who play this game for score will probably be appalled by what they witness in this run. But if you're trying to get your first 1cc of the game and that's kind of the goal, then I think this is a pretty viable strategy. You will be one extend short of the extends that you can get. But I think overall, if you're able to bomb more and all that sort of thing, it kind of trades off anyway. So here we go into stage two. The main thing you want to do for scoring in Crimson Clover, by the way, is you charge up your Ray Force attack. That's what I call it, the homing thing. And you want to fully charge it up and hit kind of a larger enemy or group of enemies with it. And then you'll get a multiplier with a full charge. It's usually times nine something. And then it's like Ketsui, where when you have that multiplier up, you fly around and try and kill a bunch of stuff with your regular shot. And then once that's about to end, you want to charge up and refill the multiplier, rinse and repeat, and then that will lead much more quickly to your break gauge getting filled. From there, you have a kind of fun little meta, even for survival, this will come up quite a bit, of how you manipulate your break gauge. Because what's interesting about this is that unlike something like DOJ or even um, DFK, you know, the Donut Pachi games, this doesn't just have one hyper, it has a two hyper system. This has come a, become a little bit more popular, and I do wonder if Crimson Clover sort of originated this concept, where the way it works is that you'll have your first hyper, kind of like you have in most uh, cave shmups, but then once you get your hyper fully charged, you can double break, which means it's like an ultra hyper, so you get much more damage, you'll uh, increase your stars, increase your points, increase your multiplier. I mean, it's you know really cashing in. The drawback of it is that you cannot bomb out of it and that once you've used it all up you're completely spent as far as your meter and that sort of thing and of course i believe it increases your rank a good deal that is my theory i'm not entirely sure how much that works but but my estimation i'm assuming double breaking a bunch is going to jack up your rank at least it should if you follow the sort of logic of how rank works in most uh in like doj and those types of things so you see, once again, I reset my bombs. I rebombed a little bit more than I wanted to in this stage because what can happen in a Crimson Clover, and you'll see this, I think, in the next stage, depending on how well I play, is you can get yourself in what's I, what I call sort of a bomb loops, kind of like chain deaths in uh, other shmups, where once you bomb, I guess I'll explain the bombing mechanic a little bit. So once you bomb, it not only activates your bomb, but it also increases the amount of meter that is required to bomb so your bombs are not little items that you pick up like in uh, the Pachi series instead what they are is they're little bits of your meter and so every time you bomb that meter requirement goes up and then once you fully max it up max it out you basically need another meter and so um, once you get that all filled up then what you need to do is you need to either try and break make enough meter to get to a break that's the idea you don't want to bomb really you want to just be breaking pretty much all the time with your meter but uh, if you need to do it for survival then you'll end up bombing but then it increases the amount that you need for the bomb and so you'll get yourself in these sort of ugly bomb cycles where you're in a tough situation but you can't gain enough meter to, to break or hyper whatever you want to call it so you end up just bombing again but then that punishes you and then you keep getting punished over and over and over until you eventually die or get a break. But anyway, so this section here, I'm trying to do a lot of um, wide shot there. Uh, it's kind of a, difficult to explain how this stage works. It's a pretty interesting stage. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a Mushi stage, something like that. Like Mushi stage 4, I think it is. Some That's what it kind of reminds me of, especially with the... Uh, dragonflies that you get the robot dragonflies here the way this guy works is he has these fully charged shots you basically want to dodge the left of them but kind of clinging to the shot a little bit kind of grazing it um, not an actual graze like in a toho but just for positioning and then when it goes for the third one that's when I always use my break 
you'll see that I am trying to avoid double breaking as much as possible. The reason for it is if you double break, not only are you vulnerable to getting damaged because you can't bomb, but also because it takes longer to recover from a double, br double break than it does to recover from a single break. For, and, I'm, and I believe it increases your rank more, though I'm not entirely 100% sure about that. So for those reasons, that's why you'll see me basically going for single breaks for survival. Another thing about Crimson Clover that I should explain is when you want to do a lot of damage, you kind of have to do this sort of uh, target pumping you see there where you charge it for about a second, fire, charge it for about a second, fire. This makes Crimson Clover actually pretty exhausting to do lots of runs on because you have to do that over and over and over and over and your hand can get pretty tired. I tried to set up an auto fire button for it and it kind of works, but I was finding that it was doing less optimal damage than when I was uh, doing it manually for the most part. So that's just something that I found out. I wonder if you could set up the perfect auto fire button. I'm not sure because you kind of need to hold it. And that was the problem with the auto fire button that I was using as I was getting it to about the amount of time that you want it to fire, but I wasn't holding it. You know, the auto fire button button wasn't holding it, so I don't think it was doing full on damage. So here we go. The robot uh, dragonfly section. That's definitely a callback to Mushi, if you remember that section in stage four. Um, it's a little bit more bite sized, which I appreciate, but pretty challenging nonetheless. You'll see me here. Now I can uh, go in for that hyper. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just stay alive till I get the hyper. There we go. We got it. Now we should be in the clear here. The thing about uh, Crimson Clove that I think will be really useful to understand is that a lot of the level design is created in in mind with the hyper. So I'm you probably could clear the game without ever hypering and stuff like that. But a lot of the time it's going to be very challenging in certain sections unless you know when and where to hyper. So hyper routing in this game even for survival is pretty crucial. And so when I have so my route here is all pretty much planned out when I'm hypering for the most part. So here we go into stage 3 boss. This is going to be well, that section there was probably a big wall for people who don't play this game all that much because that's a pretty challenging section. And then this boss is, I'm sure, a wall for people. I remember the first time I played Arcade Original, I died and game over to this boss. And uh, so I was like, wow, okay, this, this is actually a pretty challenging mode. Uh, a little bit of advice is when you need to do really complex dodges or really precise dodges, try not to uh, fire your... Uh, ray force lock on shot too much just because it kind of makes you jitter around because you'll decelerate and accelerate so whenever I get into really tough sections where I need to do precise dodging you'll see me holding and charging my shot that's because I don't want to sort of uh, lurch forward into a bullet which can happen a lot this pattern here is real ugly real nasty my recommendation is just to double break it uh, if you can get away with a single break that's good but um, so you can, of course, just dodge it, but then it starts to accelerate, and weaving through this is pretty challenging. So here we go, get a break. Oh, had I gone a little bit more left, I don't think I would have had to double break. Double breaking is nice in one degree because you'll finish out this pattern here real quick. You don't have to dodge it, but it's kind of um, a risky move because now you have to basically dodge this final pattern, which is pretty challenging to do, especially with type Z. So I was resigned myself to if I would have died, I think I would have kept playing, but we really want to avoid as many deaths as possible early on. I mean, obviously, but especially in this uh, this game, because you definitely need a lot of resources going into the TLB and the boss before the TLB. That's kind of how I'm starting to understand how games with TLBs work, especially one loop games where basically you just need to get so good at the rest of the stages that you barely ever die and so that you can come into the final two stages with a, a lot or the final stage sorry the final two bosses with a lot of resources so notice here I think I have my first extend already um, no I haven't I haven't even gotten my first extend that's how low rank I've made this and it ends up working out I think um, because the distance between the rank that I was uh, gonna get anyway is pretty large so I if I wasn't playing for score or whatever or wasn't playing for stars specifically I wouldn't have gotten it anyway so why even get close to it right just stay far away from it 
and get the bare minimum stars basically to get uh, one below the maximum extends that's the idea anyway so this cloud stage is a lot of fun it, it is a great uh, fourth stage four stages are always interesting in bullet hells because they they tend to be either really fun or just obnoxious as hell <laughs> depending on how stage four is a uh, delivered to you I really enjoy stage four of this game something like uh, DDP stage four is also very very good basically what goes on here is that this early section is all about building up your meter and avoiding these larger planes and uh, it isn't actually all that challenging it's actually easier than I think uh, mo most of the uh, stage threes ending there and then you go into this sort of uh, mid boss section here with these little mini enemies here uh, that's gonna get you watch out for those surprise attack uh, cannons those are gonna get you in this stage well, the first time you play it they're gonna get you because uh, a lot of enemies shoot them and uh, they're basically the first time you really encounter them I guess you do encounter them in stage 2 but not to the same degree and so you're always the way I handle those is I always just dodge like they're going to shoot at me so that if they shoot I'm prepared if they don't shoot it you know no skin off your nose type of thing here we go into the cat's eye. Uh, I've, this is definitely inspired by Toho, I think. Or maybe some other bullet hell has this first, but I always associate this with Toho. The style of a pattern here where you're sort of encircled in, a, in an eye formation. This one is actually in a star. And then you have to dodge uh, the bullets that sort of um, spawn in between you. Uh, Don Maka Limited 3 has a section like this that I call the cat's eye. That's basically the uh, make or break as far as a very high score or just short of a very high score because it has a ton of uh, chain value to it and then if you milk it you get even more chain. But anyway, so the ID here with Crimson Clover is I found you kind of don't want that last one by itself because it gets a little bit tricky to dodge. So what you want to try and do ideally there is to just dodge. Uh, are just to damage them all about evenly and then kind of kill them all at once you notice here that I saved my uh, meter that's because this section here is pretty challenging you have to go up and around this ship you can't fly over it uh, you may think that you can it kind of makes sense that you would but you actually can't initially it'll damage you if you fly over it until you uh, blow the sort of center part up I always thought that's a little bit weird but whatever and then once you blow the center up you have to watch for these sort of chains. The The way to do it is to sort of advance. I remember here having my hand on the bomb button. I was ready and prepared. Um, getting through stage 4 without dying is a pretty big deal. Because if you can go into stage 5 with uh, a lot of resources, that greatly increases your opportunity. This part here, I've never been a fan of. I can't quite figure out how to dodge these little uh, sea urchin things. Because I don't know how they damage you. I think if I bust it out like a save state or something, I could sit there and research it, but I always end up getting killed by those, and I'm not quite sure how exactly. I'm not sure what they're hitting me with, so I just found a little setup there to abuse bombs. If you're playing for score, that's not what you want to do, but if you're playing for survival, because because of that recovery item, you can kind of do a sort of jank uh, bomb uh, strat there that you saw me do. So then the idea here is you just want to make sure that you're taking these guys out quickly speed killing them otherwise they'll stack on top of each other and that's not good I used my break that's kind of okay because you basically can rebuild up your break here anyway so here we go into boss 4 this is a really fun boss the only real challenge of it well it's actually pretty challenging but the part that always tends to get me is the end or the section where it starts to crisscross I'll show you here the idea here is you want to blow what the sort of center cannons on the left and right you make sure you want to make sure you take those out use the bomb uh, better to do that oh I do take a death on it okay so that's unfortunate I was hoping I no missed the uh, the whole game but no I didn't I mean up to the boss of course but anyway these crisscrosses are deceptively difficult they don't look that bad when you look at them but something about them is actually really hard I think because they always sort of change up in sort of weird ways and they crisscross in kind of weird ways they will get you a lot. It doesn't seem like they should. It seems like they should be kind of just standard dodging, but something about them, maybe the ship movement, maybe how they change, uh, they'll sort of get closer together at times and further away, stack on top of each other in weird ways. That always sort of gets me. 
So with this now, you want to... This is an homage to Grega, no doubt about it. The final boss in Grega where it has this little sidearm. Except these ones you can destroy, where in Grega you can't destroy them. The important thing to know is when it has that, that launch cannon that you saw where it shot that huge barrage of bullets. The thing about it is cancels don't seem to work on that thing all that well. So what will happen is that you will cancel the attack, but the end of the attack will still come out and hit you. That's what tends to always get me. Um, okay, got the break. Okay, good. So I did end up dying on the crisscross, but I was able to get through that without taking a, taking a second hit. Routing that at the end there is very important because if you double break too early, you'll end up in a really ugly situation where you're getting pinned in. And that thing flies around pretty erratically with those lasers going, so um, that's always kind of a tight fight. They're kind of a tight dodge at the end there. So if you can get a bomb off or a hyper into a bomb or whatever you need to do, try and abuse the vulnerability and kill it quickly. But sometimes if you double break, that actually can be pretty challenging because you're not damaging it enough to quick kill. And then you have to make some pretty uh, tough dodges. So the, the idea here is I'm trying to build up to a hyper. That's really what we're trying to do without taking a death. But I do find that using a lot of a regular shot here is very useful. Okay, you got the hyper. Very good. Um, so there's these cannons. You're going to basically just need to memorize where they are because otherwise... You're going to get locked in by those things. Either they're going to just surprise shoot in the face like that right there. Or they're going to pin you into the corner. Because not only do they come at you pretty fast. But they linger on screen for a very long time. And basically uh, block off parts of the screen. And so they can, if you're not careful, they can pin you into corners. And there's nowhere to go. And there's not much you can do about it. So this kind of reminds me of uh, the final stage of Mushi right here. Where you're weaving and bobbing through all these different onslaughts to try and get these cancels. I don't think the uh, big uh, cannons give you cancels, but the big tanks and stuff will give you cancels. So there you go, misdirect. Now we're going to go for that tank, get the cancel. Oh, very, very uh, clutch break right there. So up next, you're going to see these enemies spawn. There's a kind of a trick to these guys, so I want to let you know what that is. When the missiles are coming down, you don't want to use your tracker attack or your ray force attack because basically there's a little bit of split time where you stop firing to launch it and then it's uh, missiles destructible missiles will kill you so if you're firing your ray force attack you want to fire it from the center if you're dodging around it you want to just hold your concentrated shot so here we go I think we're coming into okay not the mid boss yet this is sort of the checkpoint you'll get a little bit of text here um, it usually say, I don't know what it'll say, but it'll say your name in the text. For some reason, the game stopped doing that for me. I don't know why that is. If I, it was some kind of setting or something like that. But uh, yeah, it usually gives you a little bit of text there. But for some reason, maybe because it could tell I was grinding a bunch of runs over and over or I hit some sort of button, but it stopped doing that for me. So if I press B again right now, I double break, but I didn't do that because look, now I recovered with a bomb, which I was needed, which I needed there. Of course, double breaking could also protect me because you kill things on screen but the issue is again that I would risk ending up possibly with uh, more rank than I want and also risk ending up just without any meter in a really tough dodging situation uh, speed kill this guy take out the popcorn weave up and around this is very mushy like right here get the uh, break get take out the so this um mid not mid boss but this enemy here those little uh, tracking turrets on them what you want to do is you just want to tap dodge around them but you have to be careful because it can push you into the wall here we go to the tank mid boss fun fact if you come into some of the mid bosses like this one with no extends when you kill it it will give you a fun little uh, extend option let's see if I'm able to no miss this guy because all the runs except the ones where I have no extends I don't uh, I always get killed on it some way or another. Let's see here. So bomb. Now I got to come up into the center here. So what you normally do, this is the one part where I tend to double break. Because if you just double break him right here, it will kill him. But now I'm kind of in a weird situation, so I actually have to dodge. Got the cancel. Okay, I got a break activated. Activate the break. Come up. Yes, uh, abuse the invulnerability before I start attacking. Very good. 
So recover, definitely, that's an easy choice there. So I found a nice little strategy to use on this mid boss. This one can be real challenging for players who aren't used to dodging things coming up from behind you. That's kind of a skill that you have to hone and develop. It doesn't seem like it makes a difference, but dodging things coming up from behind you, at least for me, at first was pretty challenging. But the, the trick that I'm going to pass on to you is that it's spawning these sort of tanks here. Uh, don't really worry about them. Just spam this attack like this at this rate and the tanks won't hurt you. So you can concentrate all your energy on uh, this guy. Of course, don't fly into them. But other than flying into them, you're basically perfectly fine from them. So you just want to concentrate on this guy. You also can set up where you sort of want to uh, do tight little tap dodges when it does the blue spears. And then when it does the uh, purple gear looking bullets, you wanna go up and around. So left and around or right and around. Those you can kind of macro around, around pretty well. So once you get those concepts down, that mid boss actually isn't all that hard. So here we go into the final rush section. The good thing is, if you play a lot of Futari, if you play a lot of Mushi, uh, you'll know what to do here, which is can't concentrate on one thing the cancels. It's all about the cancels. Getting them set up, getting them working. Again, this reminds me a lot of Mushi Stage 5. The way you have to kind of weave around things and just crawl into getting cancels just in the nick of time. That's how this works as well. So then you crawl around, keep firing, keep firing. Stuck in the corner, I got the break. I'm gonna break. Yep, get the uh, cancel there. So this is what you're going to do over and over. And again, if you want to do this for survival, I'd recommend not double breaking. Just keep doing breaks and then you'll keep building the meter back up and uh, you can abuse the vulnerability, you can abuse the meter, all that kind of good stuff. Here we go. Got the uh, cancel there. Very simple. Up and around. Uh, don't underestimate those guys because I think they can uh, shoot little uh, pot shots at you. So the way you handle this section here these are spawning turrets is I first remember playing this and I was having trouble with these guys what you want to do is you want to be aggressive against them you want to be coming kind of at them and going up and around up and around in this sort of a pattern you'll see here but you want to stay aggressive you don't want to let them corner you because that's when they get real tough so you want to stay on top of them and speed kill them I kind of like you do in Ketsui I think that's kind of the the idea where if you go into the corner and you try and loop up and around them They'll actually start to sort of wall you off and snipe you because they aren't static. You'll see they're sort of flying around. So it makes just uh, the kind of classic C-shaped shepherding pretty challenging. I, that's why I recommend just kind of getting on top of them, doing quick cutbacks back and forth. Here we go. This boss. This boss is the bane of my existence. I always struggle on him. On paper, he's not all that hard, but he is hard. So here's a big macro dodge there, uh, preparing for my break. This pattern here I dislike quite a bit because I die on it because uh, the perspective of it is weird. It, like, is that this weird sort of perspective for some reason? And I always struggle to dodge it, but it isn't like a classically difficult pattern to dodge. It's just because the perspective was weird. Made those nice uh, clutch dodges. I got that from watching Jamer's replay where you basically want to stick the nose of your ship right up on top of him. Yep, smart bomb there. We're going for the break or whatever you call it, the cancel to the next phase. Here we go here. This phase has always killed me on my really valuable runs. We'll see if I'm able to get through here without taking a hit. Uh, the idea is, no, of course I flew into it. That's even more annoying. The idea here is you need to target and blow up those guns on top of him. And so you need to move from left to right, left to right. Otherwise, they'll sort of just stack on top of you and wall you off. So you have to sort of fly left to right, left to right. But if you do it too hastily, you'll fly into the laser as you saw me do, which is unfortunate. So right here, I'm just trying to go for another bomb. Maybe get another one here. Oh, I had to make that dodge. Very clutch, though. So a classic trap that guy does is do not double break on him. 
So what can happen is you build up enough meter to do a double break, and then it goes into that pound, um, pound sequence there. And then you'll break, and then you'll go to dodge, but then you'll get a double break. You see, now I just squeaked in that final extend. So sitting pretty good here extend-wise. So when I was playing this, I thought, okay, this is a real viable chance to clear. Uh, this pattern can be pretty pretty difficult to dodge with type Z just because he's so fast his uh, concentrated movement speed is pretty fast fun little tip if you do a bomb or a break um, and you get a full charge don't fire it right away because basically his shield will bounce it off instead what you want to do is hold it until his shield comes down then you can hit him with a nice big juicy um, full full uh, ray force fire this pattern here I'm not a big fan of just because for me I really struggle to track these bullets their movement is so erratic and strange uh, it's a cool pattern though um, I do think it's well done and fun to dodge it's just you know pretty scary so here we go this uh, strategy here works with type Z I think it works with the other ships it's just a little bit trickier because type Z has really great movement speed which is actually really useful for the TLB it's funny enough it's hard, it's kind of a 50-50 because it makes certain patterns harder, the ones like this where you need to do a bunch of micro dodging, but it makes the ones where it tracks you and flies at you and stuff easier because you can get around him. So I guess pick your poison. Like this, you can just go nice up and around. Uh, just keep going up and around. You can just fly in circles around that guy. Just make sure you do it at the right speed. Here we go to the final phase here. Um, I think I'm gonna bomb. That's a safety bomb. I didn't necessarily need to do that. The thing about it is bombs aren't that useful for the final attack. They're really not. Uh, it's better to have an extend. So here we go. I'm down to one extend. What I really, really, really want to do is come into the final attack with this extra extend. Because I have had no misses on the final attack, but they're not easy. So here, don't be afraid to use bombs. There's always kind of a weird uh, part where he switches up and kind of, kind of corners you. I end up, almost always end up taking hits. This pattern here is actually pretty good to put a lot of damage in on. You just kind of follow along and then you have to do kind of a risky cutback. Luckily I did enough damage not to need to do it a second time. So here we go. So this is very important. This is like the final attack of Hibachi where when you have no bombs, having that extend coming in, doing a bunch of damage with that initial extend is very important. Here's the kind of a thing you want to do. So you need to dodge around these guys. The pattern is kind of complicated, but you kind of go up and around, up and around, up and around them. What you don't want to do is you don't want to just sit at the bottom of the screen and try and dodge left and right. That will get you killed instantly. Instead, what you want to do is you want to kind of cut up and around, up and around, and then you'll find these openings. I was really proud of how that came out there because I didn't end up needing the uh, final life there, which I could have, uh, you know, choked away as I did. I think I had four runs before this where I was very close to getting the clear, but just barely janked out just a few seconds away from the clear by that final attack. So I'm really glad I came in there and was able to do, I think, a no miss on the final attack. At least one miss on the boss. Pretty good stuff. The score is nothing to write home about because it's a low score. Intentionally low to keep the rank uh, in check. But anyway, yeah. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. Arcade Original is a pretty t challenging mode, but it is a lot of fun. I think Type Z is the ship to do it with. It's the best ship, but it's also pretty tricky because of its speed. But yeah, thanks so much, everyone. I'll end this by asking to subscribe if you can, which would be really nice. And also, let me thank my patrons. Adios. So thank you to 72 PCT Water, Adam Pearson, Adrian Reyes, Ukshay Wadker, Dingo, Anticapped, Anthony A, Ben, Ben Wynn, Borgie22, Brian Reboot, Brian Shiver, Corio, Danielle Savage, Delta Tango 6, Disco Star Slayer, Dominic NG, Eric H, Full Set, Retro Shmupper, Geriatric, Don Maku, Hausu, Ilya, Kiwi, JLab, JBRPG, Joe Angelo, Game Boy Guru, K, K2, Kiko Man 589, Larage, Malaise, Mark Toms, Maz, Mayher Kalendrian, Minong, Queen Charlene, Nathaniel Davis, N Electron, Nine, Oakland Googles, Philip Mason, Portal 63, Ram Q, Raul, Real Skeen, Sketchy Raccoon, The Boot Rex, TRM, Sugumo, Yishi, Plasmo, and Yutakaya. Thanks for watching.